Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. This week, we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, going through verse 11. Chapter 2, verse 5 through verse 11. Last week, we concluded that initial body of the letter where Paul proclaimed God's faithfulness and Paul swore, you might say, or swore an oath that according to his conscience, he had done, he had acted with regard to the Corinthians with integrity and with their best interest. In fact, he changed his plans because he did not want to grieve them. He didn't want to create a, a more negative situation. He didn't want it to reverberate through the congregation or in their relationship. Paul thought of himself as, as the father of this church, as the planter of this church. These are his children, and he doesn't want to grieve them. He wants to share joy with them. And we talked about that last week in terms of uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. But there was also this sense that Paul did not visit them as he intended to visit them, because he wanted to spare them. So he wrote a letter instead of visiting. And the letter was apparently confrontational. It, um, it identified a particular offender in the church, and we'll talk about that tonight. But what we got from last week was that Paul changed his plans. He did not return from Corinth to Ephesus and then immediately go back to, to Corinth. Instead, when he returned to Ephesus, he wrote a letter, and he sent that letter with Titus to Corinth. And now Paul is rather anxious about what's going to happen next. How are they going to respond to this? And what we have in 2 Corinthians is, is that Paul gets a report from Titus. He meets up with Titus in Macedonia, which a story we'll tell more fully later on. But he meets up with Titus in Macedonia. And he gets a good word from Titus, that they responded to Paul's letter well. But they're still a little confused about by all the different changes. And last week we talked about how Paul changed his plans. One, because he wanted to spare them. He didn't want a person-to-person -person or face-to-face -face confrontation that would worsen the situation. So he wrote a letter. And he didn't want to, he didn't want to grieve them. He, was, he wanted to take the best possible route to reconciliation. And so that's why Paul wrote a letter that in his judgment, in his view, in terms of the grace of God and the ministry of reconciliation, Paul thought a letter rather than a visit was more appropriate and had more potential, you might say, <clears throat> to um, uh, execute the ministry of reconciliation, to reconcile Paul and the Corinthians, and to restore the joy of their relationship. In this section tonight, we get a, a, a window into that letter, just a very brief window, and we also get a window into how the Corinthians responded to that letter. Paul's kind of jumping ahead of himself a little bit in the sense that he hasn't told the story of being reunited with Titus. But he is focused on, on what happened as a result of the letter. Because he needs to tell that story in order to pursue more fully this ministry of reconciliation between himself and Corinth, and also the offender, some particular person who was the cause or the primary instigator or primary representative of whatever the problems were. So as we read the text tonight, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, we see Paul responding to their response to his letter. And this is the word of the Lord. But if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but to some extent, not to exaggerate it, to all of you. 
This punishment by the majority is enough for such a person. So now instead, you should forgive and console him so that he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. I wrote for this reason, to test you and to know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. And we do this so that we may not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. The word of the Lord. So we're focused on some particular individual. Paul writes a letter to Corinth. It's this severe letter. It's this confrontational letter. It's a, it's a letter that apparently um, shook the Corinthians and awakened them to the situation that they find themselves in. And particularly with regard to a specific person whom Paul calls in chapter 7, the offender, the one who did me wrong. We don't know with any certainty what that is. Remember, we're kind of dropping into a conversation here, a conversation that has been going on for years and has involved multiple letters and multiple visits and envoys and letters from Corinth as well. And so we're dropping into a conversation about which the, the Corinthians, they know who this offender is. And they know what he did or she did. They know what's going on. They know the complications in their community. And Paul knows it. And Titus knows it. And Timothy knows it. We don't know it. The letter wasn't written to us. It was written to the Corinthians with all the shared knowledge that Paul and the Corinthians have about this particular situation. Now, when we think about, okay, who wronged Paul and wronged him about what? We don't know the answer to either one of those questions, really. We don't know who it is, and we don't really know about what. Now, what typically happens is when we don't know something, we tend to fill in the gaps best we can. And for the history of the church, the tradition of the church has typically identified this offender with the incestuous man who had his father's wife in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because after all, you know, we have 1 Corinthians and we have 2 Corinthians, and, and 1 Corinthians identifies this offender, the incestuous man. And 2 Corinthians talks about an offender. So to correlate the two seems rather um, obvious or innocuous. It's a, it's a nice fit. But you have to remember, there's a lot of stuff going on in between all this. And there's a lot of conversations taking place. First Corinthians is not followed immediately by Second Corinthians. There, there is time and conversations and a Pauline visit to Corinth in between. So to, to make that jump from First Corinthians 5 to Second Corinthians 2 is not as easy as it might seem. In fact, most modern readers and scholars tend to think, no, nah, that identification doesn't work. There are some who still defend it, of course, and there's some plausibility, there, there's some significance to that, but I think it's best to say we just don't know. And if we want to speculate, it might be more tied to the kind of problems that Paul's dealing with in 2 Corinthians, that the, the one who wronged Paul is the one who who made these kinds of charges that appear up over and over again in 2 Corinthians, kind of, oh, Paul's fickle, or, or Paul is not a real apostle, or he doesn't uh, have the credentials of a real apostle. Uh, he doesn't have all the visions and the revelations, and he doesn't have the prosperity, and he won't take our money. He won't, be, you know, he won't participate in the patronage that is so important to our culture. Paul suffers too much to be a real disciple you know something about that maybe more that than some kind of uh, immorality but both could be true or neither could be true we just don't 
No. What is important though, is what we do know. We know there is a person who did Paul wrong. And apparently the Corinthians did not stand up for Paul. They did not defend Paul. They listened to this person and they in some way followed this person or took sides with this person in such a way that, that Paul left intending to return to deal with it even more. Maybe, and why Paul left, we're not really told why he left. Maybe it has something to do with he didn't want to, to give them further grief or he didn't want to exacerbate the situation. But now that he has left and with the intention of returning, but he writes this letter before he returns, maybe to create some time, to create some space where the Corinthians can reflect on what happened and think about it more thoroughly. And the letter gives Paul that opportunity. It gives him the opportunity to boldly confront the situation and to do so with perhaps a heavy hand. And so he writes this letter, what we call the severe letter or the painful letter, or it's a letter of confrontation. And seemingly he says something about this offender when he's talking to the Corinthians through that letter. In fact, he says um, that Paul wrote for this reason, to test you and to know whether you are obedient in everything. Apparently in that letter, Paul laid down kind of a line and said, look, this is, this is the truth. This offender who is doing me wrong is making false charges, is uh, got the wrong idea about the ministry of reconciliation, doesn't understand the gospel. You know, whatever the particulars are, Paul lays it out pretty clearly, apparently, because the Corinthians respond to that. And the majority, as Paul says here, the majority punish the offender. The majority sitting down in some sense. We don't know exactly what that means, what kind of punishment that is. I mean, that may be, may be exclusion from the community, which is what Paul wanted to be done to, uh, to the incestuous man back in 1 Corinthians 5. And of course, the exclusion does a couple of things. One, it is supposed to be an opportunity to create an awakening in the one who's excluded. Oh, this is really serious. Oh, I'm cut off from the community. Oh, I'm, I'm not a part of the beloved community anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm not connected anymore. I'm to miss the community. It's supposed to be a sufficient weight to create an awakening in the soul so that one sees their sin or sees their insolence or their arrogance. It awakens them to the true sense of the gospel and what Paul is calling them into. Maybe that's what the punishment was. We, we don't know for sure what the punishment was, but apparently it was effective because this person is now overwhelmed with sorrow. He recognizes, or she, whoever this is, recognizes that they caused Paul pain. And Paul says, not only pain for me, but pain for the whole church. This was disrupted to the whole community. It wasn't just wronging me, it was wronging the community as well. And this is why the situation had to be dealt with. We had to confront this person in order to deal with whatever the sin was or whatever the particular problem was. So the punishment of the majority, Paul says, was enough for such a person. It, it, it awakens something in them. And apparently they repented for, they, um, for he's overwhelmed with sorrow. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talks about the godly sorrow that brings people to repentance. It's not just he's sorry, he got caught, right? It's not that kind of sorrow. 
Rather, it's, it's the godly sorrow, the, the deep sense of hurt and, and the deep sense of regret and the deep sense of, okay, I, 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 I missed the mark here. That kind of godly sorrow leads to repentance. So the person apparently, given the actions of the community, which presumably were healthy actions, created the awakening and this person repented. But now what do you do with him? <laughs> Once this person is repented, apparently the Corinthians, when they excluded him or whatever kind of punishment they uh, exacted, they, they keep doing it. Even though this person has godly sorrow, they, they keep him or her at arm's length. And this is what Paul wants to address. We might surmise that this is what Titus brings back to Paul. Titus might tell Paul, look, your letter was effective. It, it persuaded the Corinthians. They see your point, and they recognize that this man treated you, mistreated you, and uh, did you wrong. And they have acted. And they have excluded him or punished him in some way. But they're not letting up. They have excluded him perhaps in such a way that, that this man feels unloved and an outsider and is penitent and wants to be part of the community, but they're not letting him back in. And that's why I think we have this section of the letter here. Paul says, you know, I'm involved in, in, in the ministry of reconciliation. That's, that's my ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. And yes, sometimes we have to be confrontational. Sometimes we have to point out sin. And sometimes we have to perhaps exclude or punish in some way. But when someone repents, it's time for reconciliation. It's time to come together again as the beloved community. And so Paul says, what you need to do, Corinthians, which is another form of now a test of obedience, because this is about obedience to the gospel, because what the Corinthians now need to do, Paul says, you should forgive and console him, to forgive, to show him grace and console him. Presumably a man. Forgive and console. Now, console might remind us of chapter one, right? the God of mercies and consolation, the God who consoled or comforted, the God who comforts us in all our afflictions, the God who comforted Paul in his struggle in Asia. And now, if we are going to be gospel people, if we are going to be people who are identified with the God of all comfort and the God of all grace, then we need to be people who show grace. And we need to be people who comfort others. If you want to obey the gospel, forgiving and comforting are a part of that, including affirming love. Paul says, I want you to affirm your love for him. Include him. Love him. Restore him. That's the gospel of reconciliation. That's the ministry of reconciliation. And Paul says, when the community forgives, I forgive. And whatever I have been forgiven or what I have forgiven, if anything, Paul says, I do it for your sake. I do it for the community's sake. It's, it's not that I'm, I've been wronged and therefore I'm going to hold on to this bitterness and this resentment and this revenge. This person wronged me. He needs to suffer more. He needs to suffer longer. No, he's repented. Include him. Affirm your love for him. Forgive him. I have forgiven him. If there's anything that needs to be forgiven, I've forgiven him. And you have forgiven him. And 
If you've forgiven him, I've forgiven him. There's a mutuality there, you see, that the community comes together in the ministry of reconciliation to include the other and to forgive the penitent. And it's interesting the way Paul says this. He says, we're going to do this for your sake in the presence of Christ. We're going to do this for your sake in the presence of Christ. That's an interesting way of saying that, isn't it? Your sake. I forgive for your sake. Not for my sake, per se, but for your sake. And I'm going to do this in the presence of Christ. You see, forgiveness is other-centered, right? It's for your sake. And it's Christ-centered because the forgiveness takes place in the presence of Christ. Before the face of Christ is literally what you might render that. It's in the presence. It's in the face. Christ is a witness to what's happening. Not only a witness, but Christ is the empowerment of what is happening. God, God is the presence of love and faithfulness and comfort and mercy. And in the presence of Christ who reconciles us with God, we reconcile with each other in the presence of Christ. To be a participant in the ministry of reconciliation where God is reconciling the world to God's self in Christ, then we must be a people who are reconciled to each other in the presence of Christ for the sake of each other given who God is and what God has done. To do otherwise, to do otherwise is to give ground to Satan. Paul says we do this, this mutual forgiveness for the sake of each other in the presence of Christ. We do this so that we may not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. This is part of a, a conflict, not just within the Corinthian church, but it has its roots in the conflict between God and Satan, between the God who, who pursues reconciliation and Satan who disrupts reconciliation, who disrupts community. The offender was an extension of Satan in the community. And Paul calls the Corinthians, you need to be participants of the reconciling work of God and not a participant in what Satan is doing. Because to fail to forgive the offender is as much satanic as what the offender himself did. This conflict or this uh, tension, hostility between God and Satan is something that we'll see over and over again in 2 Corinthians. Satan is named three times. He's also called the liar. He's called the serpent. Um, we'll see him in several different contexts. Paul lives with kind of an awareness that there's a lot at stake in the ministry of reconciliation, and there is one who opposes it, that the principalities and powers of the world, that the satanic and demonic forces of the world are in opposition to the ministry of reconciliation. And so the Corinthians need to pay attention to who they are, to what their motives are, to what they're doing. Are they forgiving and consoling? Are they affirming their love for the offender who has repented? Are they welcoming back those who have repented? This is a test of one's obedience to the gospel. Whether we forgive and console and affirm our love, or whether we seek revenge and harbor resentment and act out of bitterness toward the other. How can wrongs ever be made right? You can't make a wrong a right. It's always wrong. 
but you can restore relationship, build trust, and develop a community of mutual love, mutual grace. That's what Paul wants for the Corinthians. Forgive this offender. Don't let him sit in this overwhelming sorrow and be dragged back into the clutches of Satan. Recognize what kind of battle you're in. You are the representatives of God and the agents of the ministry of reconciliation. Paul says, that's why I forgive. You forgive and console him as well. Let's return to the joy of our community. <clears throat> now, having said all that, we do need to remember something really important here. Reconciliation takes two people. It takes two people who want the reconciliation, who pursue it and who act accordingly. This is not a call to forgive in the sense of reconcile with, to affirm and console and forgive and affirm love. This is, this is not reconciliation with a person who arrogantly, deliberately continues in their sin. This is a person who has godly sorrow and has repented and seeks communion with the community. That's the person that Paul is talking about, a reconcile, reconciling ministry with them. When we have in our midst a person who is um, deliberate, rebellious, intent, maybe not even in overt ways, but is a predator among us, an abuser among us, this is not the person that Paul says to forgive. The abuser among us who continues to abuse and who is impenitent, is unrepentant, and does not acknowledge wrong, does not seek forgiveness, does not seek consolation, does not seek the joy of the community, but rather persistently maintains their own pride. That's not the person Paul says to forgive and console and affirm. In this text, the person Paul wants you to forgive and affirm and console is a person who is penitent of their sin. The abuser who continues to abuse, the predator who continues to pray is not someone that we take into our community and affirm. Rather, that is a person around whom we must put boundaries. One, we must, as Paul put it here, punishment. Whatever that might mean. For an abuser and a predator, it would at least mean we protect the community from this abuser and predator. That can be a hard word sometimes. Because if we have a past abuser among us, and who has sought forgiveness, and who has sought reconciliation, and who is penitent, and it has godly sorrow, at least as far as we can tell, and we can only take the fruit and the life and the uh, living amends, the living amends that is present in our sight, we can receive that and affirm that. And if there is a person who has come to us in that way, given whatever past they may have, but yet has the potential of some danger to the community, such as a pedophile or an abuser, domestic abuser, for example. Perhaps the community is not out of place in putting boundaries. And if a person is authentically penitent, and they are authentically seeking relationship and community, and they 
truly want the joy of the community. They will accept whatever boundaries or guidelines that the leaders of the community put in place for the safety of the community. To not accept such a guideline is in effect to say, I'm more interested in my own rights than I am the safety of the community or the joy of the community. If the community can have joy with my presence given guidelines, let's enjoy that. But to refuse to submit to guidelines is a function of pride. There was a moment in my life when I submitted to a group of leaders. And given the struggles that I was having in that moment, I told those leaders, whatever you tell me to do, that's what I will do. Even if I don't like it, even if I don't want to do it. If you tell me to do it, I will do it because I will trust God's wisdom among you. And I know my best thinking got me in a bad place. So I need the good thinking of others. When we have penitence, when we have confession, acknowledgement, and we have a desire for reconciliation and a desire for community, and a submission to the leadership and the wisdom of that leadership, the community can work with that. And the community can feel safe with that. And the community can flourish with that because it is a penitent offender. The impenitent offender, however, is not one whom we, with whom we reconcile. We do not reconcile with impenitent offenders. Paul's letter to Corinth was, you got to deal with this guy. And when they dealt with him, and Titus says, Paul, they dealt with him, but boy, they, they, they really gone overboard here. And they are not, uh, they're not receiving his repentance. Paul writes this letter and says, look, if you're part of the gospel, if you're an agent of the gospel, you're a minister of reconciliation, and a person is penitent and confessing and has godly sorrow, you forgive and console and affirm that person. That's the gospel. And that person who is authentically penitent, confessional, and sorrowful for that history, whatever it may be, that person will not be demanding their rights. They will be submitting to the wisdom of godly leadership. By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.